for the citizens, which are South Sudanese citizens in the Republic of Sudan and the citizens of Sudan in the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, on the 22nd of March, uh, our president, General Salvatir Mayadid, sent a very high level delegation to Khartoum with a letter of invitation for President Bashir to come to Juba uh, so that uh, the two leaders can actually pack their signatories on two areas where our delegations in Addis Ababa <coughs> had agreed and had initialed those. First, the four freedoms, and then the issue of border demarcation. And actually, President Bashir was expected to come tomorrow on the 3rd of April so that the two leaders can meet uh, in an atmosphere of harmony and cooperation uh, so that we will be able to agree on the, on, on the remaining issues. I think this is very, very important. Our delegation, which was led by our principal negotiator, uh, Mr. Pagana Mu, who is the Secretary General of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, which is the, the ruling uh, party in the Republic of South Sudan, uh, with a very high uh, level of uh, group of ministers, and uh, Minister of Defense and others, Minister of Interior, Minister of Foreign Affairs and others, uh, they were received by President Bashir, who himself personally said he was very pleased and that he would be coming to Juba. That was on the 22nd. Now, on the 25th of, uh, of March, uh, the Minister of Defense of the Republic of Sudan visited their troops at the border point, and on the 26th, they intensified. They are attacked by aerial bombardment using national aircraft. They bombed uh, one of our stations called Panaquat and Jao area. And uh, this was later on followed by a, a ground attack on the two positions. As a result of that attack, the SPLA was able to repulse the attack which came and pursued the, Su the Sudan Armed Forces back to, to, to Italy and our troops. So there was no attack which was initiated by the Republic of South Sudan. The attack was by the Sudanese armed forces. And our troops, all they did was actually to protect their territorial integrity. They repulsed the Sudanese army that attacked and in pursuit, in pursuing them up to the village area and our forces returned to where they were. So it is not true that the Republic of South Sudan attacked. There's no truth in that. The Minister of Defense visited from Sudan, visited on the 25th, and on the 26th, they attacked and bombed our positions. Now, we believe this thing was initiated in order to find a way to actually sabotage the visit of President Bashir to Juba. They turn around, they say, oh, there is war now between the, South, uh, the Republic of South Sudan and the Republic of Sudan, and so it will not go ahead, that President Bashir will not come ahead. So we know this was organized because they had already prepared for an attack. Now, while we speak at the present moment, uh, yesterday, 1st of March, at about 2 a.m., they also started bombing some of our areas. They bombed a small village called Manga, which is about 120 kilometers inside the Republic of South Sudan from the border of Sudan. That is 120 kilometers they came in with the engine of weapons and bombed our territory. And that is about 20 kilometers from Bantu, which is the capital of the unity state. You might, incidentally, this area is where the oil fields are. Uh, to, uh, that, that, was, that was yesterday. 2 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, about 2, uh, that is, you are talking about 2.40 minutes. And, uh, and at about 14.20, uh, the same day, during the day, they actually launched a ground attack on our two positions at Panaquaj and Jao. The Sudanese armed forces with the militia groups. They actually amassed about 4,000 militia troops, militia groups, together with the Sudanese armed forces. They attacked our position at about 2, uh, the, the 1420 yesterday. Of course, the SPLA was able to repulse this attack uh, on the forces. Uh, and started to pursue them. So the attack on two places, that is on the village of Manga, as well as on uh, Banakwaj and Jao area, have been effectively repulsed by the Sudan People's Liberation Army. Uh, as we speak today, they are still continuing at Brandon, all over the unity state. Of course, the purpose also 
is to sabotage the investment in oil which is supposed to take that place. As you know, the Republic of South Sudan has shut down the oil fields and are preparing to build our own refineries and build the pipeline. <coughs> and of course, the Republic of South Sudan has agreed with some of the investors who are willing to build these facilities. And therefore, when they go about bombing these oil areas, of course, they scare the investment and sabotage the process of investment for us in order to resume exporting uh, our oil. I think that is very important. Secondly, they would like actually to cut off these oil fields in the unity state so that they can be able uh, to, to say, look, bring in the militia groups and maybe foster a regime change in the Republic of Sudan so that whatever uh, militia groups that they are sponsoring, because as the Minister of Media, the Minister of Media said yesterday on Friday, when she was talking uh, that uh, now they have no more diplomacy, uh, engagement in diplomacy, and that they would be involved in securing of, uh, I mean, of borders through war and securing borders with an iron fist and uh, sort of retaliation, uh, double retaliation processes. Now, in the meeting of the National Liberation Council of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, this is the ruling party. In our last meeting, which was actually uh, two days ago, our president, uh, General Salva Kiir Mayadi, who is the chairperson of the SPLM, uh, in fact assured the citizens of the Republic of South Sudan that we are not to take back our citizens into war once again. We believe the remaining, the standing remaining issues can be resolved through peaceful dialogue using the African Union and other, uh, and other of course, international organizations which have contributed so much for us uh, to reach at this level. So we have come here to prove the region because uh, the Republic of Kenya, through EGAD processes, has contributed to end a very long uh, civil war that continued in the Sudan, and it was successfully concluded through a people's decision, through a referendum, people voting to determine their own future. And therefore, we are saying that the African Union uh, should be taking its responsibility. There is nowhere on earth where a sovereign, another sovereign state goes and bombs another sovereign state, and the whole, everybody is quiet. I think this is completely wrong. Uh, we believe that our position is to defend our territorial integrity, which we will do. We will not cross into the Republic of Sudan, but we will protect our territorial integrity. We know that there are outstanding issues which are remaining, which we believe the duty of the African Union High Implementation Panel, led by President Mbeki, should be in a position to resolve these issues. While I speak to you now, our delegation, which is led by our principal negotiator, Mr. Bagana Moon, the Secretary General of the SPLM, deputized by our Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Interior, the Chief of Staff of the SPLA forces, have been waiting in Addis Ababa in order for the two teams to meet. In fact, the only person that came from the Sudan was the Minister of Interior, but the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Sudan and the Chief of Defense Staff never turned up because they were sort of preparing for this war that they have been conducting for the last two days. And I think maybe now, after they have been repulsed, maybe some sense will come over in Khartoum so that the process of peace is strengthened. This is the purpose why we are here with my colleague, Emmanuel, he's now, he's not here, he's meeting the President of the Republic of Kenya, so that the, the issues are clear, the issues are made clear. The aggressor is the Republic of Sudan. The Republic of Sudan is not interested in peace. We have agreed on the viability of two states. That is the Republic of Sudan and the Republic of South Sudan. And what is the viability of two states? Because most of the oil fields are within the Republic of South Sudan. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, found out because of the creation of two states, the Republic of Sudan lost about 70% financial deficit. We recognize that. And we said, no, we will be able to help to see that the Republic of Sudan economy does not collapse. In that process, throughout the negotiations, we had agreed that the $7.7 .7 billion, which is the financial deficit that has resulted since the South became independent, that is affecting the Republic of Sudan, the Republic of South Sudan was prepared to pay one third of that amount, which is $2.6 to the Republic of Sudan over three years. 
This is to strengthen that economy. We had agreed on this. Secondly, we thought that it should be a package. As we paid this amount, 2.6 billion, the other remaining part, part of it should be met by the international community, and the other part should be met by the Republic of, of Sudan. We had even agreed with them that should the process go smoothly, I, the Republic of South Sudan and the Republic of Sudan together, we can go out and meet our friends so that more funding can be raised since they need this amount of money. And that's what they basically told us. They needed $10 billion. We don't have any $10 billion to give. But we said we would be prepared to give on condition that first we resolve the oil issue. That the rate they are charging us, $36 a barrel for the transit fees, ladies and gentlemen, is not found anywhere in the world. Nobody can pay that type of amount. We know the Republic of Chad transports its oil through Cameroon. They pay a transit fees of 40 cents a barrel. Azerbaijan, the former one of the former Soviet republics, actually transports its oil through Georgia and through Turkey. Through Georgia, they pay 18 cents a barrel, according to the length of the pipeline. And through Turkey, they pay another 28 cents. That is 56 cents, 46 cents, I must say. Now, they are telling us that for our oil to pass through the Sudan, the pipeline we had contributed to build together before we became two states, they would charge us $36 a barrel. This would automatically mean that we would lose 60% of our oil to them. How would the resource of another sovereign state be used by another sovereign state? We said, look, we are prepared to go even up to $1 a barrel. That is one. We will be able to give a financial, a transitional financial assistance of 2.6 billion over three years in order to strengthen the economy because we need to cooperate in terms of trade, in terms of cooperation. Number three, we said we need guarantee that our oil is not taken again without any permission. As you know, what the Republic of Sudan did, the first thing they did, they blocked the export of our oil at Port Sudan port. We had loaded about four ships with nearly six, uh, with nearly two million barrels of, 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 of crude oil. They prevented these ships to leave Port Sudan for the international market. That's one. Number two, they started to order in their ships, and we're loading our oil into their ships to the value of nearly 800 million that they were going to sell without our permission. They forced the oil companies to load our oil, taking it by force. What is the companies that, they, that the third thing they did, they prevented another four ships which were supposed to dock at Port Sudan to load more of our export of oil to go out. That is the third thing they did. And the fourth, they say we should pay a transit fees of $36 a barrel. Now, people are saying, why did the Sudan, so the Republic of South Sudan, close down the oil field? Already Bashir had already closed it down. They prevented our oil from going out. They took the rest without our permission. They prevented the, the ships from coming to dock in order so that we load more oil. So why would we be allowing the oil to be pumped when we are not getting not even a dollar from it? That's why the Republic of South Sudan thought that, no, the best thing is to close down this, at the oil heads, close down this oil until we resolve these issues. If Khartoum agrees to do business, commission prices, which we can afford, we cannot afford to pay $36 a barrel. We are able to afford the international cost which is allowed and which and we are not prepared to cause sort of crisis in the, in, in the oil market where we go out next time when we transport oil through, through Lamb. We will set precedents throughout the oil industry. We couldn't afford to pay $36 a barrel. Now Bashir went out and started bombing our areas. I think this needs to be understood very clearly that if today the Republic of Sudan agrees to charge us the commercial rate, and we are prepared. There are two, there are two lines. We said we will pay for the shorter route, for the night blend, we will pay about $69 a barrel, and for the dark blend, we will pay 73 cents, uh, I mean, uh, 69 cents a barrel, and the other one is 73 cents a barrel. With this, and they guarantee, they guarantee that they will no longer prevent our oil at the port of Sudan, port Sudan to for the international market, they make sure, I don't know what you call these people in Kenya here, 
If somebody takes your thing without your permission, Muizy. you know the word. But diplomatically, I'm uh, trying to let you know exactly what the Republic of Sudan is. They took our oil without our permission to the value of 800 million. Now, with these offers, ladies and gentlemen, what would the Republic of South Sudan do? So, virtually, the shutdown was initiated by Sudan. They, they, they closed our oil because when they took those steps, it automatically meant we were not getting anything. It is better we keep our oil on the ground and we build our pipeline. We have agreed with the, the, agreed with the Republic of Kenya that we are going to build another pipeline to Lamb. That is a commitment. Two, we have got a second line that we, have, we also built with through Ethiopia down to Djibouti. The one to Lamb is about 2,000 something kilometers long. The one through Djibouti is a little bit less. We believe that these projects, as, as, as our phrase now we say, prosperity is in multiple pipelines. So that we are not again held at ransom and taken hostage as what the Republic of Sudan is doing on us. This is the oil issue, which I would like to clarify to this audience, that what goes out in the media there, as if the Republic of Sudan has not nothing upstairs, has come upstairs that we just closed down our oil, which pays a lot for our budget. We have put down austerity budget, until that time, we will agree with country to give us a commercial break, guarantee they will not take our oil again. Yes, we can resume, but that will not stop us transporting our oil, building our oil, building our pipeline to Lamu, and also through Ethiopia to Djibouti. We have also signed contracts with companies, United States company, as well as a Chinese company to build two facilities. These facilities will have to be, I mean, uh, refineries. These refineries are for the time being so that we can begin to process some oil which will meet our local needs and some needs in the region. And I think the bombing, this random bombing, which is being done by Khartoum, is to scare off some of the investment which is supposed to take place, like building of the refineries. That is the ball game they are doing. Everybody understands that. So these are some of the things. We said a package that we offer transitional financial assistance of $2.6 billion over three years, on condition that the issue of Abia is resolved, that Abia is given back to the South. It was a part of the Republic of South Sudan and was transferred during colonial days to Khartoum. It was not a choice, it was an administrative order for logistical reasons. We would want that resolved. We would want to resolve the issue of the borders so that they are fully demarcated. While I speak to you now, there are five disputed areas at the borders, and they have been bombing. <laughs>